Dr. Schwell, vaccine shortages are a big story right now, and certainly getting more people vaccinated is a key part of getting us out of this pandemic. Um, there's been some big news this past week with Johnson & Johnson releasing preliminary data about their vaccine candidate. Tell us more about that. Yeah, so on January 29th, Johnson & Johnson and Janssen Pharmaceuticals released some preliminary data on their phase three trials on their new vaccine candidate. We want to go through that data and specifically how it relates to the other two vaccines that have already received early use authorization from the FDA here in this country. But before we get into that, let's talk about the mechanism on how this new vaccine works. Now, each person has about 37 trillion cells in their body. And this screen is zoomed in way into just one of those cells. Here we have the cell right here. This is the membrane of the cell. This area here is the cytoplasm. And this area here is the nucleus of that cell. Now, do vaccines work on just one cell of your human body? No, they work on a number of cells and that's kind of dependent on the dose. But what we're gonna do here is show what a vaccine does to a single cell and then you can multiply that. And whereas before with Pfizer, BioNTech and Moderna, they used lipid droplets to get the messenger RNA into the cells, this works a little bit differently. So let's go through the steps. As we can see here in step number one, in the laboratory, what they've done is they've taken an adenovirus, which can infect cells on its own, has all the machinery to do that. And simply what they've done is they've taken the DNA inside of the adenovirus and they've spliced in the information for that spike protein that is on the surface of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And so here we have information for the cell to make the spike protein for the SARS-CoV-2 virus, but it's encoded into a double-stranded DNA segment in the adenovirus itself. And so this takes place in the laboratory, and the vaccine is made. Now, when they do this, they take out the parts of the DNA in the adenovirus that allows it to replicate. And so this virus, when it infects the cell as the vaccine, will not be able to replicate. So the proteins on the surface of the adenovirus are still able to interact with the proteins on the surface of human cells, which then allows it to infect. As we can see here, the strand of DNA in the virus, which is supposed to go off to the nucleus and does, and would normally tell the cell to make more adenovirus particles, instead makes a messenger RNA that gets transported out into the cytoplasm where the cell machinery, instead of making adenovirus particles like it would normally would, is now going to make SARS-CoV-2 spike proteins. And the same happens exactly as we would see from this point on in the Pfizer or the Moderna vaccine. So the difference here is that we're actually using an adenovirus as the mechanism or the vehicle to get the information into the cell. That's the first difference here with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. By the way, this is also very similar to how the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine works. The other difference here is that this is a DNA particle that is going into the nucleus of the cell, again, very similar to the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, making the messenger RNA and then onto the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. Okay, now we have a better understanding of how this vaccine works. I think what people really want to know is how does this vaccine stack up to Pfizer and Moderna and AstraZeneca? Kyle, based on what we're seeing here with this data, and I would caution again that this is not published uh, peer-reviewed data, but the data that we've been given um, is actually somewhat encouraging. Uh, there are some caveats to this, and, and you have to dive deep into the numbers to get the information that you need. Uh, first thing off is that it's a one-time shot. It's not like there's two shots like you need with the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine. If you look at the efficacy and how they define it, the definition of efficacy here is that the patient did not get moderate or severe disease. So mild was okay in terms of the definition of efficacy. Now it's different in the other types of vaccine studies that we've looked at with Pfizer and Moderna, whereas any kind of symptoms is what they wanted for efficacy. So if you look at the efficacy of Pfizer and Moderna, that was 95 and 94% respectively. But remember, these were done at a time when the prevalence of variants, like the UK variant, the South African variant, and the Brazilian variant, uh, were not really that prevalent. And so 
what's kind of stacked against the Johnson and Johnson candidate here is that they did their studies when there was much more prevalence of these uh, variants. And in fact, they did the studies in those very countries on purpose where those uh, variants were. So it's going to be interesting to see how that pans out here. But if we look at the numbers and we try to compare them as best as we can, 95% for Pfizer, BioNTech, 94% for Moderna, and 66 overall percent efficacy for the Johnson Johnson. Uh, but if you look deep down into that and you look and see which countries they were in, you'll start to see that, for instance, in the United States, there was a 72% efficacy where there's not a lot of variants. In Latin America, it was 66%. And then, of course, in South Africa, where that worrisome variant is in high prevalence, about 95%, there was 57% efficacy there. And so that, on one hand, on first blush, looking at that, you're like, well, that this is kind of a, a disappointment. But in fact, this vaccine actually gets better with age. Uh, so if you look at the data a little bit deeper, you'll see that at day 28, overall, there was an 85% efficacy in terms of preventing severe COVID. That means, that means hospitalization and death, okay? And that's really what the, the whole purpose of trying to get this pandemic under control is, is to prevent severe COVID-19 that causes you to go to the hospital and die. But what's really interesting about this, Kyle, is that as the antibodies start to be produced, it's felt uh, that by day 49, Okay, so 49 days after the, the vaccination, and, and again, there's only one shot here, there was 100% efficacy that was preventative at severe COVID and also hospitalization. So nobody by day 49 was hospitalized or had severe or died severe COVID-19, even in places like South Africa, where the South African variant was very high. And I think that's very encouraging news. Well, we've talked before about how mild side effects um, are relatively common with the COVID-19 vaccines that have been authorized so far, pain at the injection site, maybe some fever, feeling fatigue. How do the adverse effects stack up with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine versus the other ones that have been authorized so far? So the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, Kyle, it's kind of interesting. The serious adverse events were actually very low. In fact, they were lower in the intervention arm. So those people that actually got the vaccine had lower adverse events, serious adverse events than those in the placebo arm. And so it's a question is why would that be? Well, it, it may have been statistically or in statistically significant. What they believe is it could be related to the fact that those in the placebo arm were unprotected from getting COVID-19. And so there may have been some idea that maybe the, the effects of the COVID-19 that they got may have been increasing the serious adverse events like fever and, and the symptoms that you would get from, from getting COVID-19. But it, it brings a bigger point here is that here's a vaccine that is a one shot. It uh, doesn't need special refrigeration and it, it appears as though it may actually have less side effects than the other vaccines. But we don't know that because it wasn't a direct comparison uh, in this vaccine compared to the other vaccine. So we can't say that it has less than the other vaccines, but we can say that it's pretty low, pretty low profile of uh, serious adverse events. Of course, scaling this vaccine up and um, having it fill, fill the gap and increase the supply in the United States is a priority. It's a priority for every country around the world right now. Um, so what do we know about cost of this vaccine? Yeah, so Johnson & Johnson has been committed, and they've, they've said this in black and white print, that they are committed to using this and producing this in a nonprofit way so that it can be distributed to the world as quickly and as uh, inexpensively as possible. Do we know anything about this vaccine and its ability to block transmission or the spread of COVID-19 to other people? No, we have not gotten that type of information at this point. You know, one of the ways that we learned about that with the, for instance, the Moderna vaccine was that there was a special screening done at the second dose of the Moderna vaccine. And, and it was based on that data that they were able to come up with about a 67% reduction, two thirds reduction in 
asymptomatic transmission with the Moderna vaccine. Uh, obviously, there's no second dose here with the Johnson & Johnson. So I think uh, we're going to be waiting uh, for more data. There's probably going to be some uh, blood tests and things of that nature if we want to look at that with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Okay, Dr. Schwell, I'm going to put you on the spot here. If you had a family member or a friend come to you and say, all right, there's two vaccines in the United States that have get, been given emergency authorization. There's a couple other uh, viable candidates. There's AstraZeneca. There's this Johnson & Johnson. Which vaccine should I get? You should get the vaccine that you could get into your, if you choose to get the vaccine, you should get the vaccine that you can get into your arm as quickly as possible. Look, thousands of people are dying every day here in the United States from COVID-19. Um, and hundreds of thousands of people are coming down with SARS-CoV-2 infections every single day. So the one that's going, all of these work effectively at preventing the worst outcome which is hospitalization and death. I would hate to see somebody wait to get the vaccine that they think was better and in the interim come down with a, a case that could be fatal. That would be a, a waste in my opinion. So the reason why there's so many of these is because we, we need so many vaccines that we can't just depend on one type of vaccine. So I'm glad there's different ones. Um, there, it's another tool in our tool shed in the fight against COVID-19, I would say sign up and whichever one is closest to you in terms of timing, get that one. Don't forget to check out our other videos at medcram.com and check out my interview with Lewis Howes at the School of Greatness. Thanks for joining us.